All right, we're going to get into the word this morning. And uh, I was thinking about uh, this message is titled Into the Light. And I was thinking about uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we were in Sun River on vacation. Anyone ever been to Sun River before, Central Oregon? Bike trails, miles and miles and miles and miles of bike trails, so many bike trails. And we were getting toward the end of our vacation. We were there with some friends, and, and we, had just, we had realized we hadn't done the bike ride. Now, the bike ride is several miles long, and it goes all the way out to a marina, to some horse stables. There's actually an airport out there, and it is many miles long. And it was getting toward the end of the day, and we were thinking, we've got to do this bike ride before we go. So we, we called up our, our friends who were staying in another house and said, are you guys up for the bike ride? So we went on this bike ride, and we get out there, and we're, we're riding out far out of town to the marina, to the stables. I mean, it's miles out there. And we're watching this beautiful sunset, and it's just amazing. And we realize as we get out all this way, we're going to lose light. We are going to lose light. We had no flashlights. We, we weren't prepared. And, and we, we, we stopped where we were and we asked some people, do you think it's shorter to go back the way we came or to go the way, go around the whole loop? And we kind of, re, uh, they kind of said, well, it's probably about the same. They were wrong. Um, they said it's about the same. And so we said, well, we're, we're here on the bike ride and, and I'm sure that I was help leading the charge uh, and said, let's just do the loop. If it's about the same, let's just do the loop. So we get around the loop and now we're farther away from where we're staying and it's dark. It starts to get really dark. Like so dark that you weren't sure who was riding in front of you and who was riding behind you. It was that dark. And I remember I had this little cup holder on my bike and I had my phone and I was, had that little flashlight on and people were telling me, stop, that's not, it's just blinding me. It's not doing anything. And it, 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 would, it, it would be like if you were trying to take a shower and all you're getting was a couple trickles. Like that was the amount of light I was getting that was covering the darkness. And, and my, my mother-in-law, her, her eyes were bad and she was like, really couldn't see anything. It was just nothing. And if, it, it was kind of scary actually for her because it, it was that bad. It was that dark. And we made it back. I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. We made it back with phone flashlights, uh, which was pretty scary. But getting caught in the dark out when you're trying, it wasn't just a walk either, you were riding a bike, so you actually have to balance. You couldn't see the trail, so as you were going around corners, it would just sneak up on you, and I don't think anybody crashed. We made it back, but it was not the best decision that I've ever made. Getting stuck in the dark, so disorienting, and just hoping that we could find the way back. Now, Sun River in itself is confusing enough to try to navigate, there's circles everywhere. It's like a roundabout nightmare. Like if you don't like roundabouts, it's, they're, they're everywhere. And you're just trying to figure out which way is which. And so now we're in the dark and we're navigating. We finally make it back and thought that was really, really stupid. We didn't want to be caught in the dark. And there's something about being in the dark that is disorienting. As Matt was saying, what do you do in the fall storm? So many people said, light a candle or start the generator. Why? We don't want to be in the dark. There's something within us that says... We need light. And I think God created us that way. And, and if we're in places that are dark, we have got to get into the light. That's where it's supposed to be. This series we're, we're, is called Breaking Through. And we're studying the book of 1 John over the next few months. And in this book, we discover what breaking through entails, where we need to focus, what traps we need to look out for, how we fight. And we'll discover what a life of victory really looks like. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life of victory. Anybody else want to live a life of victory in Jesus? I don't want to just limp my way into heaven. I don't want to go crawling in like, oh, I barely made it. I want to have victory in the here and now. And the good news is we can. We can. And last week we saw how Jesus broke through into the world and invited him to break through in our world. And John, the premise here in 1 John is that he wants us to move from more than a belief system to a fellowship with Jesus. That he wants us to live a life that is in fellowship with Jesus. And we're going to pick up in verse 5 of 1 John 1. And before we get there, um, well, let's, let's do that first. And then we'll, we'll get into the, the message. And we're going to do communion a little bit. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a page out of Pastor Mass book. Would you stand as we read the word together this morning? 
because the word is power. All right, 1 John 1, verse 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. God, we come to you this morning and we come to your word that guides our life. Lord, I pray this morning that as this word is given that it would be you, Holy Spirit, that speaks to our hearts, that you speak to our spirit, that you open our ears to hear what you have to say to us. Not just a sermon, Lord, but that you would speak to each one of us today and that you would bring us fully into the light and fellowship with you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Go and be seated. Go and be seated. We have our, did our ushers all head out of the room? Are there any ushers left in here? No? They're all gone. All right. There's some ushers. If you did not get communion, this little guy here, if you would just raise your hand. Ushers, could you come find these people with hands raised? At the end of service, we're going to have communion. So just keep your hand up until you get one of these. If you, they don't see you, then you'll have to raise your hand higher. But we need a few people to need this communion. So we're going to do this at the end of service. Just keep your hand up. If you didn't get it, I'm going to start, and they're going to find you. Does that sound good? Okay. So we, we get into this 1 John 1, 5 through 10. And the question that we have is, is this whole idea of light and dark, is this John's theory? Is this just John's theology? It's more than that. Who, does, who is this message from? He says, this is the message we have heard. Who do you think this message is? Is from anyone have a guess? Jesus. There's that's the best Sunday school answer right there, and it's the right answer. It's Jesus. There's a message that John has heard from Jesus, and it's the message of the light of the world. The message of the light of the world that that Jesus, the light, has come into this world. In fact, it's not just a message of the light of the world, it's a message from the light of the world. From the light of the world. That through Jesus, the light has been made known. And he's continuing his focus on Jesus, the word became flesh. Jesus, the word became flesh. That's where we left off. So let me just revisit real quick John 1 so we can see exactly what it is that he was talking about. In John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, he says this about Jesus. He says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John's revisiting this concept from his gospel now to his, in his letter to the church. And he's saying that this light has come, and the darkness has not overcome it. His whole premise here in this section is that there is a battle of light versus dark. Any good movie, light versus dark. Star Wars, light versus dark. It's this idea where, where you've got this... This thing that is overwhelming, that is depressing, that is oppressive, and you have a light that shines through that darkness. And he's reminding us as he starts that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. No darkness. Even the sun has darkness. Do you realize that? If you, if you look at the sun and you shouldn't look at the sun, but if you look at the sun through the right filters, you'll see dark spots on the sun. So even the brightest thing that we know as humans actually has some dark spots in it. But he's saying God has no darkness at all. In fact, we see in the end times when God unleashes his fullness of his glory that the light of God will overtake everything. And so in him there is no darkness at all. And he's clarifying to his readers what he means by light. Now last week I talked a little bit about Gnosticism and the idea 
of this in terms of enlightenment, that there was about arriving at this intellectual knowledge. It was this type of spiritism that was happening in John's day. And this idea that if you just had a higher plane of knowledge that you could arrive at, then you will have, you'll be okay. Once you are enlightened, everything's all right. But John's drawing a very clear picture to stand against that. And he's saying when he speaks of light, he's not talking about that intellectually. He's talking about it ethically, morally, that there is a right and a wrong. There is a light and there is a dark. There is a good and there is evil. This is not about arriving at some enlightened place in which so many people in his culture and in our culture just try to be enlightened, just try to be spiritual. And yet John wants to be very clear. There is dark and there is light. Darkness represents sin. It represents evil, wickedness, and depravity. But light represents righteously living in fellowship with God. And he's referring to a direct teaching from Jesus on this topic. He says, this is the message that we heard. And Jesus said in John 8, so if we refer back to John's gospel one more time here. In John 8 verse 12, it says this, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. You see, light and dark is not a both and. It's not a both and, it's an either or. That you don't walk in, in some darkness in some light. John is saying you either walk in darkness or you walk in light, but you don't get to walk in both simultaneously. That's the message that he wants us to know. If we're going to be in true fellowship with God, it has to be in the light. Would you just say in the light? That is where our fellowship is. Because God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Therefore, if there's a problem with our fellowship with God, what's the assumption that we should make? It's our fault. If there is a problem with our fellowship with God, it's on me. Because in him there is no darkness at all. And the solution, he says, is to take anything that is in the dark in my life. Anything that is in secret, anything that is not of God, anything that I'm harboring, he says, get it into the light. Because that's where freedom is found. That's where joy is found. That's where the fellowship with God is found. And I need you to know this morning as we're dealing with this series, breaking through, some of you have got some things in your life that you need God to break through. As a pastor, it grieves my heart when I'm, when I'm walking through life with people. And it's an honor to walk through life with people in their hardest times, in their vulnerable times. But it grieves my heart to see people walking through places of struggle. Walking through places where relationships are broken. Where, where things aren't working out. They're not adding up. And, and they're walking in a direction that it seems like destructive things are happening in their life. And, and, and circumstances uh, really are lining up with their actions because that's what happens, right? There's consequences in our actions and we're just, we're stuck and we've got these habits or these addictions and we're trying to kick these things and we're trying to live and we're trying to have breakthrough in our lives. But I've got to tell you the truth, breaking through only happens in the light. That's the only place breaking through happens is when things in our life get into the light, that's where breakthrough happens. In him there is no darkness, but only light. And he's calling us in this passage to bring our entire lives into the light. To search our hearts and to bring those things that are in the dark into the light. You see, walking in darkness is a pattern of living that's opposed to God's way. It's opposed to God's way. You can actually do that completely. And maybe you know someone in your life who's doing that completely. Walking in darkness in a complete way. But you know, you can also walk in darkness partially, I've found in life. It's possible to walk in darkness partially, to have just a little bit of light, to have enough light to, to look okay, but keeping habitual sin in the dark. 
and not addressing it. To keep these things that are really destructive in our lives. To take these things that we know deep down as the Holy Spirit has spoken to us and has convicted us. And we're saying to ourselves, it's not really all that bad. It's not really hurting anybody. And we can walk partially in the dark. And this could, this could maybe be something like being open to sin. Maybe you're openly sinning and you just don't want to stop. And you have people in your life, and you're like, you need to stop getting drunk on the weekends. And you're like, I don't want to stop. It's how I come down. And you just, you don't want to stop. And even Christians deal with these things that we shouldn't, that aren't building our lives in the light of God. This could include everything from drunkenness, but it could also include things that I, I, may be more severe than drunkenness, but in the church we've made them less severe, like gossip, for example, Right? Like someone comes to you and says, will you pray for me because, you know, my, my wife's having an affair. And then you, you go to 10 people. Oh, you got to pray for, you know, I'm trying to think if someone's name is not here. Liam. There's no one Liam here, right? Okay. You got to pray for Liam because, you know, his wife's having an affair. You got to pray for him. And, and you're just like, I'm so good in the Lord. I started this prayer chain. No, you started gossip, right? And, and, and God wants to bring that into the light. And there's tendencies and there's patterns that we've got to stop. Because they're not growing us. They're not bringing us into fellowship with God. They're actually breaking our fellowship with God. And we've got to bring whatever that is into the light. And he says there's some things that keep us from doing that. If there's anything that's keeping us from doing that, we've got to get it into the light. And, and, he's, and he talks about three things. He lays out three if statements. And he says, here's the deal, guys. This is, you are self-delusional. You are self-delusional. Look at these three if statements. The first one, if we claim to have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie. Thanks for that. That's very kind. The second thing he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, which the word deceives means to be led astray. If I claim to be without sin, I am being led astray, and the truth is not in me. And then in verse 10, he says, if we claim to have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word isn't in us. These are self-delusions. What is self-delusion? I don't know about you, but I, if you've ever been called delusional, it's not a compliment. <laughs> Have you ever been having a disagreement, maybe a heated disagreement with someone, and they're like, you're delusional. That is not what happened. That's not, that's not what you want to hear in that moment. So what is self-delusion? Here's what self-delusion is. I'll give you the definition of self-delusion. It is the act of allowing yourself to believe something that isn't true, especially concerning one's true nature, abilities, feelings, etc. So self-delusion is the act of allowing yourself to believe something that is not true. I'll give you an example. Every year, we play football out on the field, New Year's Day football. And I believe that I can keep up with the teens and those in their 20s. That is called self-delusion. <laughs> because they don't limp off of the field for the next, and, then, and then hunch over for the next week. right? That is self-delusion. A belief that I have about myself. A belief where I say things, I got this. I've overcome this. I don't deal with this anymore. I don't struggle with this anymore. I'm good. That's self delusion. And John calls out these three areas of self-delusion in the church. And we're going to start from the bottom of the passage and we're going to work our way up. And the first self-delusion, I would call it, I don't need saving. I don't need saving. That is the first self-delusion that keeps us from walking fully in the light. He says, I've claimed that I've not sinned. See, if you've not sinned, someone who says they don't need saving is someone who has never acknowledged that they've sinned. You've probably met these people before in your life. At face value, claiming to have never sinned is a ridiculous notion. And I wondered when I first started studying this, why did he even have to put that? Who does that? Who says they've never sinned? And then I realized people do that, saying, I'm good, I don't need saving. To say you've never sinned, have you ever met a toddler? You were one once. So I can guarantee you've sinned. 
I've guaranteed you've taken the toy out of your sibling's hand and hit them over the head with it. You've done it. We've all come to this place. We've all sinned. But the issue that John was dealing with was this, again, this, this thinking, this enlightenment, this Gnostic thinking of enlightenment is my destination. And therefore, there's no need to acknowledge sin because all you need to do is intellectually arrive. To understand God. I wonder how well you understand God. I, I, I think it was a C.S. Lewis that if we're trying to comprehend the difference between what we can understand and what God understands, and this is insulting, but I, I'm pretty sure this is C.S. Lewis that said, it would be like the difference between what you understand as a human and what a slug understands. Like, it's a big gap between who God is and who we are. We can't just arrive intellectually. I, I know many an intellectual people. Some intellectual people are smart enough to realize that they need saving. But I've also known intellectual people who have outthought themselves. Who have, who have decided that they've, they, they, they've figured out that the Bible doesn't work for them intellectually, and they don't need saving. And yet their lives continue to fall apart. See, in our culture today, I've never sinned actually looks, I think, a bit different than it did in John's day. Where in John's day, there was this high, highly enlightened thinking. In our day, in our society, I've never sinned looks like maybe darkness trying to identify as light. We live in a culture in which... People want to identify as things that they are not, and darkness wants to identify as light. But here's the thing. If you're darkness, you don't get to identify as light. You, you don't, when the power goes out and everything's pitch black, I'm on a bike ride in the middle of a dark evening, and I can't see anything, I can't just announce it's light in here because it's actually still dark. You don't get to just say it and have it be. We take something that God says is wrong and we decide that it's right. See, our culture doesn't acknowledge sin because we've redefined it. We've arrived at this higher feeling, this higher place, this higher acceptance, this higher whatever you want to call it. And so in our culture, I don't need saving because I don't even need to acknowledge sin. I've just redefined what sin is and I've decided that I'm Okay, I've decided that my behaviors are actually not sinful. I've decided that God accepts me. Of course God accepts you, but God wants to transform you. He wants to bring you into the light. And when we take these things that are wrong and we decide that they're right. By the way, just a reminder, this was the very first strategy that Satan used. The first one. If it's the first one he used, then maybe we should pay attention to that. Here, listen to what he says in Genesis. He says to Eve, you won't die if you eat the fruit. In other words, here's what he's saying. Eve, God lied to you. God lied to you. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll decide that it's okay. She said Eve saw, saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye. What happened? Eve decided, you know what? I think this is okay. I'm going to change. Okay, maybe God said it will die, but, but you know, I, I think I'll, I'll believe this serpent. I don't know. Do you believe God who's walking through the garden with you, or do you believe a snake? But redefined the situation. Took what God said was wrong, and then said, actually, it's right. When we put ourselves in the place of God and define sin for ourselves, we actually end up walking in darkness. And we live in a world that is walking in darkness because they have placed themselves in the position of God in their own lives and defined their own sin, and they walk in darkness. John says, if you claim to have not sinned, you're actually calling God a liar. See, the truth is in Romans 3.23, we see this. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Who have sinned? All. All. We just tell someone, you are an all once. <laughs> yeah. 
for all have sinned. So this first notion is kind of ridiculous to me. That we would say, if we claim to be that we have never sinned. That's the first self-delusion that he's trying to deal with in this world. And I think our world needs to know the truth. That you can't stay in darkness and have the light. The second self-delusion he says here is, I no longer sin. I no longer sin. Now, by the way, this is a really good goal. This should be a goal in the Christian's life, to no longer sin. I think this is a great goal. In fact, when we get to chapter 3 of 1 John, we read that John says that no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. See, in, John chapter, in 1 John chapter 3, he's talking about a, a continuing, a habitual lifestyle of sin, which he equates to walking in darkness here. In chapter 1. So when we read this in a few weeks and he says, no one who continues to walk in sin or continues to sin lives in him. He's talking about what he's saying in chapter 1 here. That that's walking in darkness. But here when he says, if we claim to be without sin, he's addressing a mindset that we've arrived. That growth is no longer necessary. And it sounds something like this. I don't need to repent. I have nothing to repent for. I'm okay. I'm good. I, I, I always love people all the time. My thoughts are always pure as snow. Like that's, that's the idea. I have somehow arrived. I never sin anymore. I'm okay. My actions are constantly noble and Christ-like. When someone cuts me off in traffic, every single time, I just call out the blessings of God upon their life. Right? That's... that's ridiculous <laughs> to come to a place to say I, i'm 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 good now i gave my life to jesus i surrendered i prayed that prayer i i the pastor said to say these words i said these words and it was like you know the potion worked and i'm i'm good <laughs> and yet here we're trying in first john to to have a breakthrough in our lives by walking in the light and fellowship with god See, I no longer sin is this I have arrived mentality. That I have somehow arrived. Now, for some, some people don't have a problem admitting they aren't perfect. I, like, I'm one of them. I, I, I will admit that I'm not perfect. At least a few days a year. I, I will admit it. <laughs> I mean, a few times a day is what I meant to say. <laughs> well, after all, no one's perfect, right? Everyone makes mistakes. I'm only human. See, I no longer sin can look like that too. Ah, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. I'm only human. You know, I'm just doing the best I can. Hmm. See, we don't necessarily have to claim to have it all together, but instead we just shrug off areas of sin in our life because, well, you know, it's not that bad. It's really not hurting anyone. But here's the truth we find in Scripture. The grace and mercy of God is actually extended to sinners. So it's in my best interest to just be honest with myself. In fact, the Apostle Paul, who wrote just about half the New Testament, by the way, and was considered a great example of what it looks like to follow Jesus. When you're trying to think of somebody in Scripture who was an example of someone who God redeemed, whose life was turned around, who was filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and lived boldly and courageously for God, I think of the Apostle Paul, or I think of Peter. Here's what Paul says when he writes to Timothy, someone who is mentoring. He says this, Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.15, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the worst. That recognition that I have not arrived, that Paul says, I'm still running the race. I'm still pressing in. I haven't made it to the finish line yet. That I don't want to live a life in which I just make this assumption, I'm good now. I'm okay now. And yet, you, you say you're okay now, and yet there's this conflict in this relationship. But it's never you. It's always the other person. Have you ever met someone who's like, I don't know, I've been through like 18 relationships and I just can't seem to meet the right person. They're all messed up. And I'm like, 18, you might be the common denominator. <laughs> but we don't acknowledge these things. We'll talk about blind spots in a couple weeks, all right? It's in, it's in here. We'll get there. <laughs> well, we've got them. But to come to this place to say, you know what? Paul, if Paul can say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not without sin. 
Like, I'm striving for Jesus. I'm living for him. Like, he was, he was willing to get arrested, beaten, thrown in jail. Like, he, he was all in. For, would you say Paul was all in for Jesus? I mean, he was all in, right? He was all in for Jesus. And he says, no, I'm not perfect. I still, I'm still, God's still working some stuff out in me. And I say, praise the Lord that I have a Savior. That I have a Savior who cleanses me from sin. Like, I am so glad that I have, that, that I, when I have things in my life. Like, Jesus raised the game, by the way. He, he says, it was talking about murder. And he's like, you know, the Bible says don't murder. I say, if you even think hatefully toward your brother, then you've murdered him in your heart. And I'm like, oh man, how many people have I murdered in traffic, right? I mean, that's not my brother, but you know, same idea. And, and, and we, we deal with these things, but our heart gets sour and we start, to, we start to have things that work within us. And your wife says, you need to go play pickleball because you got to get some of this stuff out, you know, whatever it is, you know, I'm like, I'm sorry, but the Mariners won't win. And it's like eight games left and I'm frustrated, you know. We get, with these, we get these things in our lives, and we've got to get them from the dark into the light. We say, God, here's where I'm at. God, here's honestly where I'm at. I've got to get it into the light. So it's ridiculous, I think, to say we've never sinned. That's the most ridiculous. It's pretty ridiculous to say, I, I don't sin anymore. I'm good. But then the third self-delusion he hits us with is this one. You know... Me and Jesus, we're good. We're good. You ever try to tell someone about Jesus? And they're like, yeah, me and God, we're good. I'm good. Yeah, I was a baby. I got sprinkled. I'm good. Got my ticket. Got the golden ticket. Now, now here's the thing. I'm not suggesting that you and Jesus aren't good. I'm not suggesting that. In fact, I'm, I'm hoping that that's the case. But when he's saying this idea of me and Jesus are good, it's a me and Jesus are good accompanied by walking in darkness. That it's accompanied that the self-delusion actually includes aspects of the other two. The belief that I'm a good person, so I'm good with God. Or I'm not that bad compared to everyone else. Like, if you want to feel better about yourself, just go hang out with really bad people, which is a terrible idea, but people do it. Because they come back and they're like, yeah, you know, I thought my life was rough, but I'm actually doing pretty good. Perspective. But that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're not in darkness because they were in more darkness. See, I, I don't want to suggest that you and Jesus aren't good. What I'm saying is that if you have areas in your life that are in darkness, you need to get them into the light. So that you can walk in fellowship with Jesus. I'm not even suggesting that if you have some things in your life that are in the dark, that you're not saved. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that, that, that every time you sin, you lose your salvation somehow. That, oh no, I messed up. I got to get saved again. Like he holds you in his hand. But here's what I will promise you. If you have things in the dark, your fellowship with Jesus is affected. Your fellowship with Jesus is affected if you have things in the dark, and here's how you might know. God seems distant and silent. I just haven't heard God speak to me in a while. I don't know what God's saying. You can't see God working. You don't see any evidence of God anywhere in your life moving. And it just feels like, like God's run away somehow. Just as I was on that bike ride and couldn't see I didn't know who was near me. I was disoriented. That's how you're feeling. And, and, and Jesus isn't far away. It's just that there's darkness so that you can't see who's right in front of you. But he's there. And this can be the hardest to identify in someone. If there's someone in your life who just sins recklessly, it's easy to spot. If you have someone in your life who maybe has some habitual or cyclical sin or whatever it happens to be, it, it's not too hard to spot. But this me and Jesus is our good mentality. Here's, here's what happens. In an attempt to keep things in the dark, this person outwardly plays the part of a devoted Jesus follower. A devoted Jesus follower. I, I remember there was a, a season, a year when I was in, in high school and, and I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't really living in the light fully. But on Sunday mornings, 
I mean, I was the best teenage Christian there was, right? I mean, I was up, I was worshiping the Lord, I was volunteering, doing these things, but, but yet behind the scenes, there were struggles and there were sins, but somehow I was able to outwardly play the part of a devoted Jesus follower. And we do this as Christians. We do this as Christians. We pretend everything is okay. In fact, you may have someone in your life, someone here that you see on Sunday mornings, and when you talk to them, you're like, they're always good all the time. And that might be true. And if that's true, hallelujah. Ask them to mentor you. But we can put on the mask. We can play the part. You might even be fluent in Christianese. You might show up to church and you're like, I speak King James, right? And you're like, oh man, when that person prays in King James, they are spiritual. It sounds really great. But that is not the only indicator because we can hide things in the dark. Oh, but me and Jesus, we're good. We're good. I mean, I volunteer in church. Me and Jesus, we're good. I mean, I put 20 bucks in the offering. Me and Jesus, we're good. We're really good. In fact, I read a scripture today on Instagram. Me and Jesus, we're good. No, no, actually, I posted a, pic, a scripture on Instagram. Me and Jesus are really good. We can play the part. We can put on the mask. And all the while, you're struggling with relationships and addictions and bitterness is eating you alive and, and, and anger is controlling you all well. The other Christians aren't watching and you're struggling and you're wishing that you could stop and you're wishing there was a way out, but it just feels like I can't tell anybody. No one can know. That is the biggest lie. And that is what the enemy uses to keep you in the dark, to keep you in anxiety, to keep you in depression, to keep you in sin, to keep you in, in anger, to keep you in bitterness, to keep you in addiction. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. They'll judge you. You put on the mask and you play the part that you and Jesus are good. And John says, if you're walking in darkness, you and Jesus aren't good. You're not good. So now what? What do I do? What do I do with this? He says, here's the thing. Here's the solution. You get everything, all things into the light. You get it into the light where Jesus is because Jesus is in the light. And so everything that I've got that is not in the light needs to get into the light. And when I do that, a miraculous transformation happens in my life. Because fellowship with Jesus, it changes our nature. Fellowship with Jesus doesn't just change my mind. It doesn't just change my behavior. It changes my nature. Paul says it in Ephesians 5.8. He says, you were once darkness, but now you are light. And I think it's an interesting way to say it because I would have said you, are, you once were in darkness, but now you are in light. And he says, no, your very nature changed. You were once darkness and now you are light. By your very nature in your sin, you were here, but now in your fellowship with Jesus, praise the Lord, you're in the light. And if we are by nature in the light, if we are by nature light, then we should live from that position, John says, and walk in it. What does that look like? What does that look like for us? Does that look like we are perfect from here on out? No. No, but it means to, to live a generally obedient life to the Lord without harboring known sin or resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Do you ever have things in your life and you're like, the Holy Spirit speaking to you and saying, I, I don't know, that's, that's not right. And you're like, you, you just press through. You're like, no, I'm doing this anyway. It's like you're running, the light's yellow, and then the light turns red, and you're like, I'm going. And the Holy Spirit's going red light, red light, red light, and you're like, I'm, I'm running the light. When the Holy Spirit does bring conviction in your life, you respond by bringing it into the light. That's what it means to walk in the light. It doesn't mean you never sin. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But you live a life in the light when the Holy Spirit begins to bring things to your life. When you begin to realize there's broken areas in your life and maybe you're part of the problem. Then you go to the Lord and you say, God, would you show me what it is that I need to get into the light? See, people are afraid of bringing things into the light because fear of being exposed. I think, I think Christians, I think sometimes we're terrible at this, honestly. We're terrible at bringing things into the light. Lord, we pray for whoever's in that ambulance. 
in the name of Jesus. Bring your comfort, bring your salvation in Jesus' name. We are afraid to bring things into the light as Christians because, because we play the part. Man, if people knew I wasn't perfect, it would blow my image. It would blow my cover. If people knew I wasn't great, but all the while you're still so desperately needing breakthrough in your life. People are afraid of being exposed. In fact, I was in John chapter 3 this week, and I realized Jesus actually calls this out in John chapter 3, verse 20. He says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. There's a fear within us. Oh, I'll be exposed. I'll be exposed if I bring things into the light. I, I, I don't know that I can. It's too big. It's, I don't know if I can do it. I think the reason many people are leery even of coming to the altar at a church service to receive prayer and ministry is, what will people think? What will people think? I'll be exposed if I bring it into the light. And so we keep those things in the dark because we don't want to be exposed. But church, that's another deception from the enemy. And the truth is this, when you bring things into the light, the enemy is who is exposed, not you. That the devil is exposed. Listen to this, Ephesians 5.11. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Expose them. When we bring things into the light, we're exposing the evil one. He tried to take me down with this addiction, but he's going to lose because I'm getting free. He tried to take me down with this anger and this bitterness, but he is going to lose. And I'm bringing it into the light and I'm going to get the help I need. And I am going to come before the Lord. And I'm going to get this thing right. And I'm going to expose the evil one who is trying to destroy my heart toward my family. We're we are exposing the darkness that has tried to take us down. But church, today it loses its power. So let's get everything into the light. Let's, let's get these things that are weighing us, these things that are controlling us, these things that are, we've called just little stuff, little habits. It's not a big deal stuff. Let's get it into the light and have it lose its power. How do you do that? How do you do that? I want to walk you through how to do that in verse 9. In verse 9 of 1 John, as we kind of come to a close here this morning. It says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's simple. Not, not easy. There's a difference between simple and easy. It's simple. He says the first thing you need to do is confess. Confess. It's the process of bringing dark things into the light. To confess to the Lord. And you're like, but he already knows anyway. I, I, I realize that. Or maybe you're thinking, I can hide this from the Lord. Maybe that's a more foolish thinking. He knows anyway. He asks us to confess. To with our mouths say, God, this is a place that I've been not walking in the light. I've been walking in darkness, and I need to bring this into your light today. And when we do that, the second thing is this, is that it says that he is faithful and just and forgives us. And there's a receiving. Some people will confess, but won't let themselves off the hook. You'll say, yeah, I did this bad thing, and now I have to pay for it. Forgetting that Jesus paid for it for you. And so we confess and we say, God, I have this thing that's in the darkness. I'm bringing it into the light today. I'm bringing it. I'm repenting. I'm confessing before you. And I receive your forgiveness today. The third thing that happens is this. And by the way, when you do that, it removes its sin's power over you. When you receive the forgiveness of Jesus, when you confess, the light comes. The forgiveness of God comes and that thing loses its power. And then he says, be washed and clean, cleansed. Be washed and cleansed. We see here in verse 7 that it says that it is the blood of Jesus, his son, which purifies us from sin. That removes the guilt and the shame. That when we have things in the light, when there's things or in the dark, when we have these things in the light, it's simple. He gives us the scripture. It's so simple. You come to the Lord and you confess. You receive his forgiveness and be washed. Be washed. And then one more important step. Make this a continual lifestyle. Make this a regular, everyday lifestyle. When you think about it, I was thinking about communion. That's what communion is. 
And we're going to receive communion together this morning. This is what communion is. Would you just, would you just take out the, the little top little clear wrapper and grab this little cracker out? That represents the body of Jesus that was given on the cross. And we're going to confess to Christ this morning. Will you, will you actually just stand with me as we do this? I want you to just stand where you're at. It says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, Paul's instruction of the church, he says this, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Everyone ought to examine themselves. And so, so I want to just take a moment and examine ourselves. And maybe you already did this when Pastor Matt had us take a moment of reflection. But I want you to just take a moment, if the worship team could play for us. I, I want us to look, take this bread, which represents the body of Jesus given at the cross for your sin. For any place of darkness in your life. And just even look at it. It's just a cracker, but it represents something big. It represents a sacrifice made for you. And would you just, in your own words, if there's anything in your life that is in the dark, if there's anything in your life that is in the, in the, the hiding places, that is, in the, that is breaking your fellowship with Jesus, would you just confess it to him right now in this moment? Let's just take a moment to confess to Jesus. Confess to Jesus, what is it that is in the dark that you need to bring into the light today? What is it that you've been struggling with? What is it that you've been hiding in there saying, Jesus, I've got to get this into the light. Would you just tell him? Would you just whisper those words out to your Savior who hung on that cross for you? Thank you, Jesus. I confess to you. Just place it upon your body on the cross. There's any place of darkness we place upon you. We place upon you the sacrifice that you made, that it is by your grace, it is by your mercy, it is by your life that we receive our life. So Lord, any place of darkness right now, we just speak out. I give it to you, Lord Jesus. I give it to you. Just place it upon you, upon your body. Thank you, Jesus. And as we receive this bread, as we take this bread, we're receiving the forgiveness of Jesus at the cross. As you, as you, when you go to place this in your mouth, I want you to do so in a way, say, Jesus, I receive that sacrifice. I receive that forgiveness. You just take a moment to do that. I receive that forgiveness. And take the bread. Receive your forgiveness, Jesus. Hallelujah. Receive your forgiveness. Oh, Jesus, you wash us clean just right now. Receive your forgiveness. Praise you, Lord. We are in right fellowship with you as we bring these dark things into the light this morning. And we're going to take the cup together. And as we take the cup, we're reminded that we're washed by the blood, that we are cleansed, that we are purified. That right now, if you came to this place this morning and you had things in darkness and you confessed them to Jesus and you've received his forgiveness right now, he wants to cleanse you. He wants to wash over you. He wants to take that, that weight of sin off of you. He wants you to walk out of here lighter than you came in. He wants to wash over you the way that you've thought, your thinking patterns, your thought processes, the way that you've thought about others, the way that you've seen yourself. He wants to wash over you and wash away that guilt and shame by the power of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's receive the cup together. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus, that we have been washed clean and purified by you. We are clean, Lord. We, we thank you for taking these things that were in darkness and putting your light upon them, Lord. And offering your forgiveness, Lord, so that we can walk in fellowship with you, Lord. We receive that cleansing. Would you just tell him that this morning? I receive your cleansing. I receive your washing, Lord. I receive the washing over me, Lord God. For some of you, it's been years, it's been decades, 
and there's things that you've just felt stained with. You felt dirty. You felt broken. And you've allowed the enemy to continue to disqualify you by keeping this thing in the dark. And the love of Jesus wants to wash over you by the power of the blood. To just wash away right now, to wash away that feeling where you're broken in fellowship with God. That feeling where you don't hear God, where you don't see God move, where God feels distant. We just receive that washing away of that shame and that guilt in the name of Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Praise your name. You know, sometimes bringing things into the light as we confess, as we receive forgiveness, as we're washed, sometimes we've, we need to confess to someone. I know I have many times in my life, not because I needed a priest to go to, to confess, but to go to a friend, to go to someone who's, who's willing to pray with me and saying, I need to get this in the light. I need to say it out of my mouth. And freedom begins in that place. In fact, James 5, 16 tells us, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. See, getting it out of the dark and into the light is where freedom begins. The trap is the cover of darkness, but freedom is the light of day. The trap is the cover of darkness, but the freedom is the light of day. And if you sense God calling you to talk to someone this morning, do it before you leave. We have a ministry team that would love to pray with you this morning. They don't, they're not there to judge you. They're there to pray for you. They're there to stand with you. And, and, and I, will stop, you can, I will pray with you this morning. If you've got something, you're like, look, I have got to get this into the light. It has been killing me. I've got to get it into the light. I've got to get this thing into the light. And we've got people to pray for you and to rejoice with you as you walk in the light. And as we go this week, I want to encourage you, make this a lifestyle. Get into the light. Over and over and over again, into the light. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Church, walk in the light. We're available to pray with you this morning. If you just need to spend a moment with Jesus and you want to come and kneel at the front, and let him just minister to you. Please do that. Worship team's going to lead us in this song as we close. Lord God, we praise your name. Praise your name. Oh, just allow the Lord to minister you, to you right now. Praise your name. Let him just wash over you. Get it into the light, friends. Get it into the light. In Jesus' name.